understand that I am undertaking an intensive, guided encounter with my own creativity. I, Virgo, commit to weekly readings, daily morning pages, a weekly artist date, and the fulfillment of each of the week's tasks. I, Veronica, further understand that this course will raise issues and emotions for me to deal with. I, Virgo, commit myself to excellent self-care, adequate sleep, diet, exercise, and pampering for the duration of this course. Back in December of 2022, I was riding on a high. I'd spent the year in a state of deep creative exploration. What am I doing? <laughs> Just in general, like what is any of this for? Literally every single inconvenience that could have possibly happened, happened. But she's here. I have so much clay. 50 pounds of sweet, sweet, beautiful mud all in my possession. I've been crossing things off my bucket list the way that alpha male podcasters have been consistently crossing the line. But now, it's time to follow another dream, starting a small business. I feel the most alive when I'm working with my hands. Spent the last few weeks making a bunch of different necklace designs. Went on a massive adventure that changed my life. Welcome to the French Riviera. And my relationship status forever. And finally admitted to the world that I wanted to be a dancer. And then Ferger reached out to me with a proposal. I'd known Ferga from the lovely encouragement she'd left under my videos for years and the gorgeous work she shared on her own channel, but I didn't know her. Hello, Veronica's <laughs> internet people. I'm Ferga. I live in Spain, but I'm Irish. I am a writer and a filmmaker, and my YouTube channel is The Prime of Life. And I'm obsessed with her. Honestly, she's my muse. I was writing about that in my morning pages, just gonna say. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm Veronica Vacora. I'm a dancer artist, all around creative, so I'm doing the artist way journey from my perspective of dancing and all of that wonderful stuff. When she asked if I wanted to embark on the 12-week journey of the artist way together, I was intrigued. I'll admit, I didn't view myself as a blocked artist, and I wondered what I'd possibly gain from the experience. The answer? Everything. <laughs> what a pair of dames we are. I know. <laughs> you have such a like Mr. Armstein. Did you know that I literally just saw a funny girl too? No. Oh my, that explains it. <laughs> it was totally not intentional, but now that you're saying that, I'm like, oh yeah, no, that's that's definitely where it came from. <laughs> I love it. I literally love it. Okay. <laughs> so welcome back to the Artist Way journey with me and Ferga. This is episode two. I think we should start with just saying that the theme for this chapter is recovering a sense of identity. The chapter starts with this week addresses self-definition as a major component of creative recovery. So it's about like boundaries and stuff, but I thought we would start with something that you texted me about just before the call saying that like a major part of your week was Kelsa Prees getting dressed up. <laughs> so I'd love to hear so your thoughts on that. Yeah, so it's been a really interesting week in terms of rediscovery for my personal style. You guys might know if you're watching this on my channel, I used to really talk about style a lot. I'm moving away from that, but <laughs> I'm noticing that there's still like a fashion blogger in me somewhere that I just, I can't get away from. It's and in your hat. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's this interesting experience that I'm having of realizing what personal style means to me. I've had this whole thesis that I was exploring on my old blog, Where Is She Now? And it was really starting to take the shape of style to me is a form of play and is a form of self-expression and showing up in the world as the person that you want to be. I've never really been a trend-driven person unless it felt playful for me, unless it felt like, ooh, that sparks a little bit of my creativity. And so when I was going through the questions and it was talking about what is something that you feel like you're lacking in your life or like when we did that wheel and part of the wheel was play, I feel like I am so resistant 
to play for some reason. Like I'm such a workhorse. Me I, too. That was like low down on my list as well. Yes. I mean, the whole concept of where she now for me was this idea of style and adventure. And so it's so interesting because play and adventure and all of these things that are such major values in my life and yet I'm so resistant to them. So it was really interesting to go through and like this theme of getting dressed. I kept writing about it in my morning pages. I ended up going thrifting for the first time in a while. That's where I found this coat, so good. <laughs> I feel like I'm becoming this new version of myself as we go through the creative recovery process. I love going through my wardrobe, and seeing what I already have, and I've kind of been using my wardrobe as a way to get creative, it like in, in a new way. So not like, oh, I feel like I'm becoming this new person, so I want all these new things. It's more, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go through my wardrobe and see what I already have and see if I can play with that and make it something that feels more authentic to me. And I'm going through my wardrobe and I'm just like, oh my God, I have such great stuff. Like I really have such great stuff and it's just like now I'm able to put my my new found creative identity onto the things that I already have and it it's just been so much fun like such a little dress up party. <laughs> so when you said the thing about clothes I had a thought which yeah. is that the way we dress is like affirmations that are visual. Exactly. It's the same concept. It's like yeah. you 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 act like something is real that you're in fact kind of reaching for. So like the way we dress is both an expression of ourselves, but it's also this kind of like affirmation of like, if I dress in a certain way, maybe I will embody that and become it um, in this moment. And I think that's so interesting. And I think like, I don't know, like I'm really fascinated by that. And I also noticed that since doing like, we've just done like two weeks of the artist way so far but like consistently tapping into these affirmations and stuff I do find myself being campier and I feel like that's always a good sign <laughs> yeah I mean I once wrote this article for my blog that was called pajamas are a state of mind and it was the whole idea of like a lot of us are very defensive of this idea of like ah oh, I just I love that I get to work from home and live in my pajamas and I'm like, why are we, like, I don't want to live in my pajamas. And it's not even about a surface level, like how you look type of thing. It's an energy that you're coming to. I don't want to live in my pajamas. I don't want to be asleep through life. I want to be alive and energetic. At least that's how I feel when I'm living in my pajamas. Cause I totally do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just to throw a spanner into the works of this, cause like <laughs> life is complicated. Uh, like my, a lot of my like kind of style background I guess comes from the fact that when I was um, as I said in the last episode when I was 14 I got this severe chronic illness and mm -hmm. so I developed this sort of split personality split identity of like some of the time I can't get out of bed and I am in my pajamas and my hair is greasy and I'm this like very sick person and then I'm gonna like pull myself up and like try to kind of fake these moments of like being very high and being very energized and very short periods that I can like even just showing up to school I'd be wearing makeup I'd be wearing heels because I had this dichotomy in my head like I didn't know how to be anywhere in between I was either like fully like <laughs> very sick or just completely in denial and like really living in a kind of a denial like a manic denial state so for me I think a lot of the last couple of years and a lot of the kind of the identity recovery process just in my life but especially in creativity is trying to like always challenge that dichotomy in myself and I think like this is different for other people I think for other people like it's good to be like challenge the pajama mindset but for me I'm <laughs> trying to like for me I'm always just trying to be like how can I how can I uh I suppose like how can we love parts of ourselves and like show up as wonderful parts of ourselves without like kicking other parts of ourselves in the teeth mm -hmm. so like when I am being creative when I am up when I am wearing lipstick like how can I that be like an expression of loving life and not be like a self-hatred like denial of my kind of sickness and my vulnerability um mm. so that's like an interesting space to play in no that's so beautiful and obviously you have such a unique and valuable perspective on all of that and the thing about style too, sorry about my New York City ambiance as usual. <laughs> the romance of the city. <laughs> um, 
Mr. Einstein. <laughs> He's coming for me. The thing about style too is that it is what we project onto it, right? So for me personally, when I'm living that way, it's very linked in my mind with states of depression. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I stop being who I am or you stop being who you are just because you're in sweatpants or you're wearing heels. That reminds me of something that I did want to bring up as well, which I think is so interesting and so poignant for this very moment. So I took a new style of dance this week. I, it's not new, I've done it before, but it was a heels class that I've never ever done before, like a totally new teacher. One thing that he said that's really been resonating with me all week is he said, whatever you already have inside you, is already there. If you already know how to do 10 pirouettes, you know how to do 10 pirouettes. Just because you put the heels on doesn't mean, oh, I've never done a pirouette before. It's there inside of you. It's just now putting the heels on is a variation of that. And I thought that that was so, it, it's so applicable to so much of life. Like everything we have is already inside us, no matter what we're wearing or how we're showing up. Mm, I love that. I actually think it leads very nicely into another thing that really struck me from this week's reading. Um, yeah. which is, this is quote, and it's under the topic of attention. And I read it and I was just like, what? <laughs> she writes, <laughs> I was just like, hold on. She writes, <laughs> very often a creative block manifests itself as an addiction to fantasy. And I was like, so baffled by that because I consider like fantasy, like a major personality trait of mine. Like I am living in a dream. Oh, <laughs> I am I not that. here. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was so interesting because I started thinking about like the people we idolize, the fantasies we have, the kind of fiction we're drawn towards. And I was thinking about like, the films we watch, the TV shows we're obsessed with, the the influencers we follow, like, is this all a type of of fantasy? And then the idea of like fantasy being a block, because even though, because you're like vicariously living that thing, so you're not like bringing that desire and that need into your reality. You're like my my desire for a certain kind of life, for a certain kind of output, for a certain kind of confidence, or like to be a certain kind of person is being like vicariously like satisfied by this other person or this imaginary self it's also kind of interesting because a lot of what I've been thinking about this week is like how do I narrow the gap between the fantasy of what I would love to create but I'm too scared to maybe or like the fantasy of the kind of people who I would like to be or to be like um and then like what is real like how do I close the reality fantasy gap <laughs> which is like ambitious because boy have I been fantasizing a lot in my life like I have a lot of <laughs> daydreams and stuff and like I write fiction so I'm just kind of like I have a lot of stuff to work with to bring into my reality but yeah I was just I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that so do you feel like it's almost like the fantasy is your comfort zone like you're living there instead of living in the present because if it's a fantasy it's it's easier to maintain once it becomes real than it's like oh, this isn't what I thought it, it was? Like, is that what it is for you? Because I feel like that's what it can be for me. Yeah, I think that's it. And I think also when something's a fantasy, no one can see it. <laughs> so, mm, so true. you get to live the, I suppose you get to live, you get to live the life you want to live without the judgment of others for of you living it. Yeah. Um, Like, I think, even when I think about the kind of uh, writers that I really admire, and I know notice that whenever I like the certain people who whenever I read them, that's when I'm like, I know I want to be a writer. Like I want to be in conversation with this body of work. Um, mm -hmm. So like I think about like Deborah Levy has this like incredible memoir series. And I've recently really gotten into the French writer Annie Arnaud, who also writes this kind of like blend of memoir and fiction. And it's very, very personal. It's very literary. It's very um, vulnerable. And it's just it's very interesting and lovely. And I always just read those things and I'm like, this is the kind of writer I want to be. I, I want, I think I want to put a lot of myself into my work and yeah. for it to be really rooted in like my own experiences and also kind of like, I don't know, observations about life. I like kind of veering into philosophy sometimes and veering into fiction sometimes and veering into memoir other times and just being very loose. And I feel like that's a very feminine genre. Like when I think about the people who really embody it, with the exception of Ocean Vuong, <laughs> Ocean Vuong I feel like it's a very 
you know, female approach to writing, which I like. Um, non-binary, like it's very, it's a little bit of an outsider approach, which I also like. Uh, very uncommercial, which classic Ferg. <laughs> when have I ever wanted to do anything that'll make me money? Classic um, Ferg. <laughs> but it, I don't know. Like it's just it's. But then when I I I I think it's a little bit like the blurts. Uh, so for those watching, the blurts is kind of like the opposite of an affirmation. It's the things we're saying to ourselves that we don't realize we're saying. These kind of like negative ideas we have. Um, and I think a lot of mine is like I don't. I'm not allowed to do that. I'm. Like Annie Arnaud can. She's Annie Arnaud. She has a Nobel Prize. Like she can do whatever she wants. I mean, she wrote them before she had a Nobel Prize. But nevertheless, I think we can all agree now it was a good idea. But yeah, so for me, I think I, my like blurs that I have about the kind of the, the work that I want to do is like, I don't have the right to do that. Or like, who am I to do that? I think the fantasy is this this self who kind of does have the right to do that. That's what's interesting to me is like when I really start to like pick away at that fantasy and be like, what does that imaginary self who's allowed to do these things, like what is it about her that has permission that that like I don't have? And when yeah. you pick into it, it's like there's no difference. Like the permission thing is completely arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally, totally agree. And I understand that so much. I mean, I think about it in terms of like Beyonce. I mean, Beyonce is, I feel like, someone that... Go on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Just, no, Beyonce, period. <laughs> um, no, but, like, I think a lot of us look at Beyonce, and she is the fantasy. You know, it's like, well, what would Beyonce do? Or, like, I feel like Beyonce would wear this, or Beyonce would be so confident. And yet we even know that Beyonce herself has Sasha fear someone that she needs to channel someone that she needs to like help her pull out of Beyonce and into Sasha fears in terms of fantasy being a block like you said Beyonce has this right to do this or this person Annie Arnault has this person th this right to be this person but I tend to dislike whatever I'm doing because it's mine and I know myself and I know that I'm not Beyonce or I'm not Annie Arnaud or whatever the case may be and yet everyone is experiencing this and everyone has their own form of fantasy. A, a person that I really admire is Conan O'Brien and sometimes I look at him and I'm just like I just I can't even fathom that level of quick wit and he just feels so comfortable and he just and yet I listen to his podcast a lot and he is constantly talking about the people that he admired and when he was young he so desperately wanted to be this person so it's like we all do it even our greatest idols have someone where it's like I could just never be like them <laughs> yes no that's so true I was wondering if there's any kind of traits or like um aspects to someone's personality that you feel like you deny yourself permission especially like in your creative work in your dance life or in your like film life um that you like you're like curious to explore because for me and this is like such a weirdly surprising thing so much of I think of this conversation is going to be about getting playful but for me it's almost like I want to delve deeper into seriousness like I want to get to a place where I'm, I want to be taking myself more seriously. And it's been something I've been like practicing a little bit, not in my own head, talking myself down and not expecting my writing to be like cute, but like allowing it to have weight when it needs to. But the way I've been practicing it is I'm a, I have a really, really smiley face naturally. Like I just walk around the city, just like beaming at everyone and being like, how's Aww. it going, sir? Um and this week I've been practicing like walking around like a serious person just because I'm like every now and then I need to embody it. So I'm just like trying to keep my face looking like stern. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that you have to work at that. <laughs> I'm trying to have an RBF. I've never had it in my life. I'm really trying to be more aggressive looking, but I can't help it. I'm just so naturally gorgeous and smiley. <laughs> I don't know about gorgeous, but I am smiley. <laughs> I'm oh. like the one, like everyone stops. Like I have a ridiculous amount of like conversation on the street. Because <laughs> yes. I'm like the person everyone asks for directions. Everyone's like, she looks really welcoming. <laughs> um. So anyway, do you have, I was wondering if you have like anything that you're like thinking about embodying in your outfits this week or 
or in your pages if that's come up? That's such a great question and it's so interesting because I feel like I'm constantly flip-flopping back and forth between feeling like I'm not playful enough and then if I'm being playful then it's like oh I'm not serious enough so I'm really if anything I feel like I want to embody balance like that that is the thing I, I most are I'm always craving to embody because yeah I feel like I live very much in the extremes I want to be playful and you know I obviously I'm very inspired by comedy and comedians and all of those things and then when I feel like I live too much in that world then I'm like well, but sometimes I have serious things to say. Like, I'm, I'm always very afraid of being boxed in. So, yeah, if anything, I really admire people that seem to just be themselves and are able to express seemingly hypocritical things at once. Someone who really inspires me is Jordan Peele because he like is this comedian and and so funny and such a great actor and then he creates these horror movies and he can just do both of those things equally at once and he he seems very balanced like he seems very comfortable like yeah I'm a comedian I'm an actor but I also have this very serious and dark side and I love that so I don't know how I'm gonna embody that but that's what I'm going to try. <laughs> yes. No, definitely. I love that. So yeah. I wanted to ask you <laughs> regarding all the things you're embodying. Um, what, how was your artist day this week? What was it? And, um, and like, were there lessons from it? How did these kind of like questions about style and everything come up in, in that context? My artist date, no surprise, was having a little dress up party with myself, which I kind of explained before. <laughs> My parents still live on Long Island, so I'm very close to them. It's very easy for me to get back and forth from, you know, my old house and, and here. I have this room in the basement of my parents' house that's kind of just like all stuff where I'm like, I don't want to get rid of this. This. and so it's kind of like my personal my personal thrift store <laughs> it's like I go in there and I'm like oh my gosh I totally forgot I had this so I visited my parents this week and and you know I kind of went through some of that and a lot of it is just the motivation from them to like clear it out like come on you can't just you, you don't even live here anymore you can't have this room here I'm like I know but come on <laughs> so anyway I was going through all of that and rediscovering things that I I purchased in the past, like, or I thrifted in the past, and now I'm seeing a new perspective on. And I, I just had this whole little dress up party of like, what if I put this together and what if I put that together? And I was talking more about style on my channel, it kind of became work. It is something that I love doing, but when it becomes an obligation, you just sort of lose your spark for it sometimes, sometimes. So it was really nice to just not, not have a purpose to it and just, play just just play literally play dress up I love that that is so beautiful I, also funnily enough before I knew any of this a dressing up was on my list of 20 things so again for people at home later on we're going to talk about one of our bits of homework this week which was writing down a list of 20 things that we love to do and seeing if we actually do any of them um <laughs> but but dressing up was on there and it was interesting because I mean I suppose dressing up is it's hard to be like when was the last time I dressed up because it's a subjective thing like who what is up um <laughs> but it was that was an interesting thing to consider for me so anyway my artist date also is quite low-key and I like that we're like doing the the full like you know sometimes it can be a, like you know like a flanco show and sometimes it can be in your own house but my artist date was last weekend I was visiting my friend who's in a city nearby and I took a bus like kind of a like a you know cheap cross country bus and as I said to you last week I am trying to challenge myself to spend this year not like listening to podcasts not distracting myself so it was a two-hour bus journey and it's the first time I think that I've ever attempted to do a two-hour bus journey without any entertainment so, and it was actually gorgeous when I think about how I became or sort of cultivated creativity as a child and, and probably how I found my love of these things it's because when you're a child or when we were children and when I was a kid I didn't have like technology in the house <laughs> you didn't even have a computer <laughs> so um it was just like 
you you were creative and you had ideas because you were bored and because there was nothing else to do and you were entertaining yourself with your thoughts and and all this stuff and it was so interesting just sitting on a bus and having nothing to do and nowhere to be people who are like elderly and or mindful watching this will just be rolling their eyes but like I'm just relearning the joys of just like sitting on a bus and having my thoughts and you know so many things worked themselves out in my head on this bus journey so many things about the book that I'm writing so many I like videos for films like just so many so much excitement was I was able to generate in that those two hours that was really interesting and I think like it doesn't sound like much but also I think quite a lot of us I know a lot of people for whom that would be like their biggest fear (laughs) <laughs> like sitting yeah. on a bus for two hours and not listening to music or anything like they yeah. would not enjoy that and I think like that's a comfort zone that's very worth experimenting with and a boundary that's worth like pushing a little mm, bit I think about that all the time because yeah the way that we grew up really was so different than how kids grow up now and I'm always curious about how that's going to affect creativity because I feel like I even came to singing and dancing because of the very fact that I didn't have anything else to do when I was a kid. (laughs) Like I couldn't just, I couldn't plug into anything. It was like my, my song would come on on the radio. I didn't have a way to access it at, at all times of every day. Like this song that I would love would come on the radio and then I would be like rushing over to the radio. And I had this like, just, just two minutes to like choreograph something very quickly (laughs) and then I didn't know if I would ever hear the song again and it made everything so special and so unique and and yeah I mean you had time to be alone with your thoughts which is huge that is such a beautiful little date you were really with yourself yeah (laughs) so now we're going to get into the name and shame part of the episode where we talk about our inability to create joy for ourselves (laughs) I love that we're both so bad at that. (laughs) So one of the tasks for this week was to write down 20 things we enjoy doing. So our plan is based off of whatever of these 20 things that's really inspiring us, we're challenging ourselves this week to actually allow ourselves a little bit of joy and to engage with that this week. So you go first. 20 things that make me happy. Writing songs. Writing in my diary, writing novels, <laughs> editing films, walking aimlessly, seeing flamenco, came up again, being with friends, taking the bus to see a new city alone, doing yoga, getting dressed up, dancing, performing, learning, speaking a foreign language, cuddling, uh, my writing group that I'm in, being in nature, in brackets alone, question mark, reading, filming videos and going to the cinema beautiful i feel like you have such unique ones in there thank you (laughs) i'm interested in your writing group actually you might have mentioned that you were doing that uh yeah well not often that's the problem (laughs) no i was i was we were we were very good i did this really gorgeous class a little over a year ago with this writer called Fariha Roshin. They're a poet and they write articles and they write wrote a beautiful novel and they've recently written this book called Who is Wellness For? which is very interesting. Um, and they do a class called Writing with Vulnerability in Mind which is beautiful. Um, and all the people from that Zoom class that I did, um, we kind of stayed together and kept in contact and it's just lovely and we haven't been together in a while but when I was writing this I was like that's a real source of creative joy for me and I have to like shoot everyone an email and be like hey hey kids (laughs) you're such a natural leader like leading this podcast leading this writing group and I'm like I'll do whatever you ask yep (laughs) there's like six Capricorns in this writing group who do all the heavy lifting but I just like shoot into the DMs every now and then and I'm like hey guys all right so my list of 20 things that I love doing is making collages thrifting singing dancing exploring vintage shops slash boutiques writing that's very broad but I just love writing Mm -hmm. playing piano playing ukulele playing dress up reading specifically fiction and autobiographies oh (laughs) i took julia cameron's suggestion i do love making love um riding my bike (laughs) watching comedy drawing watching movies playing board games slash doing puzzles i just love strategy pottery flower arranging and planning parties 
I love planning parties so much. I know you love a charcuterie board. <laughs> yes, that's my favorite thing. I'm like, okay, what excuse can I have people over for? Because I need cheese and I need it to be pretty. Are there any of yours that struck you as like you hadn't done them in a long time? Number one, making collages. I, I used to do this thing where I had this little, what I called my self book such a ridiculous name for it. <laughs> I'm really great at coming up with names. <laughs> it was this little journal that I got and I was so inspired by it because the front of it was lined pages and then the back of it was all just blank. So for years in the back, I would make collages. Like I would just, I'm always collecting little cutouts from papers. Like even something random in the mail comes and I'm like, I have no use for this HelloFresh ad, but this looks like really pretty apples or something and I'll just cut it out and save it. I would use the back to collage and then in the front, I would just, it, it was just a brain dump. Like it was basically like a bullet journal before bullet journaling became like sexy and chic and everyone was doing it. So it was my little self journal and I used to love doing that. I had the best time and I love flipping back through it and seeing the collages I used to make. So I really, really want to do more of that. What about you? What's yours? And so two of these uh, was learning things in a very mm -hmm. like, yeah, just kind of like sitting down and being like, I want to learn something. And then also foreign, like speaking a foreign language. Um, so I'm obviously that. moved to Spain, so I'm learning Spanish. Um, and I there is like a, a w weekly language exchange night in a local bar it's actually an Irish pub which again I'm like <laughs> I was like which beautiful Spanish tapas bar are we going to and they were like the language exchange is an Irish pub and I was like oh Christ all right <laughs> we have moved all the way here and I'm just gonna hang out another Irish but fine whatever wherever the Spanish is I am that is amazing I love that <laughs> I mean it makes sense because like that's where they go to learn English and then there's an exchange there but anyway oh. whatever so that's on my list of things to do but what I think that I a nice romantic idea and I feel like my creative sense self and also my romantic self who thinks I'm living in a Goddard film are like the same guy um uh. so I had this romantic idea that one of the ways I would learn Spanish is I would learn Spanish poetry off by heart and I would like sit in a cafe and I would like translate it to English so I'd learn each of the words and then I would learn it off by heart so I remember the words so I have a little tiny book of the poetry of Gabriel Garcia Lorca who is a Spanish poet um who actually is from Granada which is where I am mm -hmm. and I think just looking through this what I want to do is I want to like take myself on an artist date this week and sit in a cafe and learn the Garcia Lorca poem off by heart makes wings that's who I want to be that's my higher self that's yeah, my fantasy I, is that I know Spanish poetry <laughs> and what a great way to teach yourself oh my gosh that's so lovely there's this film called Reaching by the Moon which is about the poet Elizabeth Bishop and there's this bit where she like falls in love with this Brazilian woman and then she's like where do you learn such good English and the Brazilian woman's like your poetry and I was like I want to use that sometime I'm just lost in my own world now I'm like I should be collaging in a cafe come on let's go <laughs> <laughs> just like rocks up to a Starbucks with your hot glue gun <laughs> They're like, ma'am, are you going to buy anything? I'm like, no. <laughs> like a herbal tea. I'll be here for six hours. <laughs> and I will need six tables all pushed together so that I have lots of room. You get it, right? <laughs> so no one likes artists. This is no, very good. That was a blurt. Oh my gosh. Affirm it. Affirm it. <laughs> Everyone loves us. We're so little. Okay. So talk to me about your little wheel, your little wheel of fortune. <laughs> mm, my wheel. Okay. Essentially, the wheel, it's your life pie. So she has you draw out six pieces of your little life pie. Work, friends, spirituality, adventure, romance, and play. And then we're supposed to put a dot within somewhere within that piece of pie. Uh, closer to the outside of the circle is more fulfilled. Closer to the inside of the circle is less fulfilled. And then we connect the dots and it kind of helps you see where you're a little out of balance. I found for my wheel that work, friends, and spirit are all pretty fulfilled right now. And play, adventure, and romance are a little bit lacking. And that's interesting because I did just get married. So when I say romance, I don't necessarily mean between my husband and I. I feel very romantically fulfilled there. However, I feel like I'm lacking in the romance of life and 
yeah, just, you know, like what, what you were saying before about your, your fantasy and learning poetry in such a beautiful way, it was really inspiring me because that's exactly it. I, I just, I want more of that, that romance of life. And there's a part of me that somewhere along the line learned that that was too frivolous. And so I really don't allow myself that. And playing, like, you know, it's interesting that work is very fulfilled, but play is so unfulfilled. I've got no problem working, 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 but then playing and just just sitting and, I don't know, people watching and, and just living, like just existing without needing that to mean anything. I have a really hard time doing that recently. Yeah, no, I'm literally, mine is identical. I mean, I'm having a bit of a low ebb season. So a lot of mine are low, but um, work and friends were great. Good. Friends. I've been seeing a lot of friends. Maybe Good. too much. Who's to say? <laughs> no such thing. <laughs> My liver would disagree. Oh, no. <laughs> I have not been saying, I have not been seeing friends in the AM. Oh. Um, um, it was really funny I was literally like sorry I signed up when I was looking through my 20 things I was like performing and I was like when was the last time I performed thinking it was going to be years ago and then I was like no last week I performed at a karaoke bar so I've performed very recently but the context was like we walked in I took a shot I sang a Shania Twain song and then I got really like I got really nauseous and left Oh my, it's, I've just been living a messy life, a messy, a beautiful, messy life. I think that it's a beautiful mess. Also, side note, if you ever come to New York or if I'm ever in Spain, if you're still in Spain, can we please go do karaoke together? Because that would be my Definitely. ultimate dream. Mrs. I'm Steen. Rule of threes. <laughs> Comedy rule of threes. But yeah, no, spirituality, exercise, and then romance, adventure, and then play all uh, especially like same as you like not the romantic romance but like the romance of life although yeah. I think that's of all of them that's the one that I've been kind of maybe putting more attention towards and I think that's been nice like even just today yeah I've been putting more attention towards that um but yeah like play exercise spirituality and I also think for me like spirituality and the romance of life are kind of the same thing oh, in totally. a way Totally. Um, and I've kind of realized that for me, like the the idea, the identity of a romantic, you know, in that idea of like that kind of orientation towards like those kind of aspects of life and that interpretation of life really is my spiritual practice, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, as well as like self care stuff, I guess, which also probably goes under that category. But anyway, I think that's kind of interesting as well, because I'm just like those two things really help each other up. So it makes sense that they're both like low at the same time. I think it's very easy to turn spirituality, whatever that is for people, but it's very easy yeah. to take that seriously, to like put that on the, the realm of of work and, and community. Like that's taken seriously in yeah. our society to a certain extent of like, especially now, like there's a hustle culture element to taking care of yourself. So I think when I, I've, I'm kind of coming to this place where I did think that like spirituality was just like meditation and stuff. And yeah. In that sense, it was another thing that I could be hard on myself about and like succeed or fail at and like tick off my to-do list each day. And like, did I do it and, and be neurotic about it? Yeah. <laughs> and while also yeah. it had benefits, but like what I'm realizing now is that it's like intrinsically personal and the more like, in many ways it should be playful and it should be related to romance, at least for me. And so I'm kind of interested in like how those things Maybe like the reason that I deflate in like my spirituality, romance, playfulness balloon. <laughs> like if you can imagine like this, but this because it's like a circle. If you imagine like that they spring back to the middle or they can be like brought outwards. Ooh. Like like what pops, what pops the bubble to make it all go back to the middle, you know? And I think sometimes like it's because, I mean, it's the concept of burnout in a lot of ways is like you don't, if you're not growing everything at the same pace or trying to have that balance, like if it's one-sided things things burst so I think like maybe my failure to maintain a spiritual practice has a lot to do with the fact that it didn't have enough romance and play in it mm, mm, I that's mean, my hot take oh my god that is such a good analogy of it like you know swelling and and growing and then popping and shrinking back yeah I mean so in my spiritual practice, someone that has been really inspiring me is actually Rafiki from The Lion King. <laughs> Aster, tell me more. 
<laughs> because there's this part of me that always wants to be very wise and and like this sage like I, I feel like that's what I'm trying to grow into is this sage person but then there's a part of me that really resists that because I have this idea of like you said you know th there's like almost a hustle culture element to it and there's a to-do list element to it and did you do this and and somewhere along the line my brain again has learned that being wise means being sort of boring and being being always at at peace I guess and not really having any fun and so like I almost resist peace because I'm like but I I like a little chaos and I like a little fun and I like a little spontaneity and so I was really reflecting on that and thinking is there is there a, an example of anyone that I can think of who balances again this idea of balance um, who balances the the wisdom with the play and for me that's Rafiki like he is ridiculous he is so chaotic he is so spontaneous but then all of a sudden he'll just like come out with this random thing where it's like but you know it in your heart or whatever like whatever he says that where everyone is just like Rafiki is that did you just say that like I thought you were just some little kook and so I really love I love that blend of just because you're sage and and you're wise and you are at peace somewhere like you're you know you're kind of clued in and you're you're tapped into something more doesn't mean that you have to be boring doesn't mean that you lose that sense of play and adventure definitely I love that I actually okay so someone did this like task with me in the writing group that I was mentioning okay. um they said if you could imagine all the people you are and all the aspects of your identity at a party who would get along and who wouldn't you let talk to each other like who are like not allowed to meet in your mind and in your in your identity and like it's a thinker like I might leave like you might I might leave it with you till next week but it's like wild but something that came up for so many people was like the intellect and it was like a room full of like writers but like writers who write memoir so it's kind of like a bunch of people who are like in self-development but also like nerds <laughs> yeah yeah and, and like what came up for a lot of people was like the spiritual self and the intellectual self like like we want to be Susan Sontag but we also want to be Oprah and it's complicated <laughs> <laughs> it's so complicated <laughs> yeah oh my gosh no that's so true I feel like it was Ruby Redstone on Man Repeller who wrote this article about again like the idea of you know playing dress up and everything she said something to the effect of oh can I take it from the cavernous hole that is my mind something in her dress up practice made her understand that she could contain multitudes and I just I don't even re fully remember what it was that she was talking about no disrespect to you Ruby Redstone it was beautiful and lovely I just I lost everything else other than that one little sentence but like that phrase of we can contain multitudes read it to Walt Whitman oh, my man it. He was quoting Walt Whitman, yes. The, the term contain multitudes did not come from I Matthew like, Peller. Oh, so Ruby Redstone. So we're going to get cancelled by the Walt Whitman stands. Okay, well, thank you for educating me. But yeah, so anyway, well, okay, so Walt Whitman via Ruby Redstone. Um, it It's just such a beautiful, a beautiful concept that I think you know, as, as I've been expressing throughout this whole episode is like just something I'm really working towards that things don't have to be so black and white all the time. It's not, it's not about, or it's about, and a lot of the time. And yeah, it's just, it's so difficult, especially like last week we were talking about the algorithm and all those things. And there's so much trying to drive us to be like very narrowly focused. One of the things I hate most in the world is when I go to parties and people are like, so what do you do? And I'm like, how long do you what have? Don't I, do? I know. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I have no idea how to begin to describe the different layers of things that go on in my life. But yeah, so just like getting more and more comfortable with that. And yeah, to bring it back to this concept of the wheel, like 
expanding upon all of these things at, at once and not seeing them as different or you know that okay this is something I'm really going to focus on or this needs a little bit of work it's like I just love your analogy so much it's this beautiful expansion happening simultaneously and they it's like breathing that is life it's breathing it's in and it's out and yeah I love that I think it also part of the journey for me has to be like understanding that like a creative life is one where like you're constantly creating like yourself as well as well as work so like you can't be trying to define yourself because I think definitions is something I find like a very comforting idea like if I was able to be like I know who I am and off I go <laughs> you know like that's never gonna change you know that would be lovely but that's not what anything's like so you have to just roll with the punches and also like Joan Didion said that we are well advised to stay on nodding terms with the people we used to be I think that's also very true of like just because you're in one season of your life where you're feeling very one way not to like let that deny all of the other multitudes you have like, like we go through different seasons but like not to like cling to any of the identities we're going through too hard and mm -hmm. to know that we also contain these other people who will show up again um yeah. I think is like yeah important it reminded me before like when I was having my little my little dress up moment, my little dress up party and going through these old clothes that I already had, it kind of reminded me of how I go back into my old journals and like, the, you know, I love my practice of being present and talking about my current life and then going into the future. What are the things that I want to, you know, accomplish in my life? But I really also love reflecting on and learning from my past self and seeing like how, yes, I have changed, but also in some very beautiful ways, I haven't changed at all. And these like epiphanies and revelations that I think I'm having, it's like, oh, I already wrote about that when I was 17. How did I totally forget that? Or like, even when I was five, I was still dealing with these same things I'm dealing with now. And and uh, noticing that in like, in my dress up practice too, is like, I go through these old clothes and I, I think like, oh, I've, I've never, like, I, I want this new thing. Like, I want to buy this new thing. And then realizing that, like, I, I have almost that exact same thing already. I just forgot about it. So it's like, we are always evolving and changing, but then we're also those little pieces of our old, old selves. It's still there. Yeah. And I actually, when you said the thing about um, the clothes mm -hmm. and wanting to buy new stuff, it, like, hit me because I was thinking about, like, how we also always want to acquire like the traits we see in others or like we want to acquire aspects to ourselves. We think that like self progression is like almost like consumerist, like we will get more and we will delete the selves that exist and we'll buy a brand new self like through reading the right books and doing our right practices. And that's kind of what's being sold to us. But like the idea that like, and it was something that I thought about a lot when I was deciding to like have my like, you know, living in silence here was like this idea of but like what if I need answers like what if I have a question that I want like because I had listened to so much self-help content before and I yeah. kind of the the thought that came to me like the answer that came into my brain right after my brain asked that question was like you have the answers and it was so like oh like maybe I don't need to listen to the world constantly when I have a question maybe I just need to listen to myself for five seconds <laughs> yes yes like tap into your tap into the podcast that is the inner wisdom of Ferga <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's all in there it's all in your heart baby um okay last thing is the there was another circle based challenge <laughs> which was to write things you need to protect and then in a circle and then the things you need to protect outside the circle, <laughs> like what you need to protect them from. So do you want to tell me like what's in your circle and what's outside the circle banging and trying to get in? There's one very critical thing within my circle that I'll talk about. And that is my new ideas. And I think I need to keep those inside my circle because what I notice I very often do is I, when I get a new idea, I get very excited and I get like 10,000 new ideas every single day. So it's exhausting and it is very chaotic up here. But what happens is my first initial gut reaction is to just like talk about it and tell everybody and oh my gosh, I just came up with this new idea and yada yada yada. 
and and that's great i'm very fortunate to have my husband jeff who is such a great listener and he is so supportive of pretty much everything i want to do all the time <laughs> so i'm very very grateful for that but there's a lot of people that you know it's it's just like they might not get it uh, not even that they're they're ill-intentioned but they just might not get it it might not be as exciting for them and so I realize I, I almost need to like prey upon this validation in other people and I want people to get jazzed with me and like and and then there's also an element of procrastination with it too where it's like I'm almost tricking my brain into thinking I'm taking the first steps towards engaging with that idea because I've just talked about it for like seven hours with 10 different people and but I'm not really actually doing anything. And so this week I actually started to explore that and I, I had this idea for something that I've been working on in the background. And rather than telling anybody about it, I just got to work. It's all I did. And it taught me that it is something that I'm really excited about and I'm really jazzed about. And I didn't need anybody else's validation to either tell me that it's good, to tell me that it's bad, and I also didn't need to, you know, maybe get embarrassed if I went down that path and I realized, oh, it's not for me. I don't actually really want to do this. You know, it was just something that I could explore within myself. And it's like me and myself are like, I'll tell you about this girl. What do you think about this? And like, we're having a relationship. Yeah. I would love to hear what's inside or outside of your bubble or both. Yeah, I think so. When I made the the bubble, I was being very literal. I was just talking about like stuff that I like doing and outside, like things that will stop me from doing it, just like making time for writing and journaling and and such. But after our conversation, I feel like I want to go back to that. Like after this call, I'm going to go back to that um, task because now I I realized that like the idea of having a bubble of things you need to protect versus things outside that you have to protect them from is much more relevant to me I'm pretty good actually lately at making time for for the things that I'm actively aware I'm trying to do um it's more like nebulous things I think what I need to be better at protecting are the things that I can't articulate I think I'm very hot bad at showing up for myself when I don't have a rationale so like so like I can say like you know writing this working on this writing project is important to me and then I can like protect it but like I just what we were talking about about the multitudes and everything like I find it hard to protect the things that I can't explain um so I guess for for what I want to like think about maybe after this call let's go back to that that challenge with the the bubble and think about like if what's outside the bubble is like my reasonable mind and like all of the criticism I give myself and all the rules I put on myself, like what's in the bubble, like what do I need to protect from my own desire to like define things? Mm. Like what are the delicate, ambiguous aspects of existence that I need to like keep in the little protective bubble and love them so yeah. that like I don't like destroy them by analyzing them to death? <laughs> oh gosh, I know. But it, it I mean it's such a delicate balance to strike because you're a writer and so you have that very analytical like always observing the world and and that's your fuel that's yeah. your fodder so yeah but it's it's so it, it can be challenging to kind of like be like okay I'm not gonna I'm not gonna over analyze I can analyze a little bit to the point of inspiration but when it becomes over analyzation like analysis paralysis now that's a bad thing and I also think like with creative writing when it kind of goes into poetry one of its the one of the values of it is that it can speak to things that you actually can't talk about with like it can writing can go beyond the power of language sometimes um yeah. so you can you know that what interests me about it is like whether I can harness it as a way to say things that I actually can't say like that language doesn't cover that in conversation like we don't have the ability to communicate but can you kind of like interpretively communicate it with like a long form more creative use of language so anyway just freeing myself up from like what I can justify out loud and allowing that to go into the mind soup I think <laughs> is interesting I'll have a better I can't even articulate that but that's a good sign I don't even mind um, 
I didn't explain that well. You know why? Because explaining's for nerds. Um, <laughs> does that make sense? Don't care. Um, <laughs> Who needs to explain things on a podcast? <laughs> not me. That ain't creative. Unless you have any other specific things you want to say, I was thinking I would end this with a question for you. Ooh, um, okay. So you said in a text to me, that a blurt that keeps coming up for you this week is that you think you won't make it or that you won't, you'll never make it. So I wanted to ask you like what the context of that blurt is and also what making it means for you. That's such a great question because that's what I don't know. (laughs) It's this idea that has been manifesting itself in so many different ways. So for example, I'm very proud to report that I can actually do a double pirouette sometimes I mean it still needs some work but I've pretty much nailed my single pirouette and I I feel really good about that so I mean it's still sort of inconsistent but I feel like I've unlocked something I bring that up just to say that for so long I was struggling with this idea that it's like I'm never gonna learn how to do a pirouette like I am just never gonna get this when I took that that heels class the other day I kept having this thought that I was noticing, I wasn't trying to let it manifest, but I was just noticing that everybody else in the class was a lot more advanced. And this limiting belief, this blurt that kept coming back to me, it was like, I am just never going to be able to pick up the choreography this quickly. Like, I don't know how everybody gets here. I don't know how everybody gets it into their body and only needs to see it once. But I feel like I will never be able to just see the choreography once and then be able to do it immediately no problem so like it just keeps coming up in all these different manifestations and so like i've just boiled it down to the the heart and the crux of it is i i'll just never make it i'll just like it doesn't matter what it is i'll never make it and i think it's interesting because my biggest limiting belief used to be I'm already too late. So that was very like past driven. Well, now I've proven to myself that I can do it. I'm not too late because currently right now I am doing it. But I think it's really interesting that my brain is now trying to reach into the future and say, okay, well, the past is the past, but in the future, you're never going to make it like this, this, future idea, whatever it is that you want to do in the future, you're never going to get to. Yeah, I don't I don't really even know what it is. I just think it's like anything that I want to do that's outside of my comfort zone. Yeah, but also what comes across for me when you're saying all that is like the most negative part of your brain, like you've you've cured it of its fear of the past. So now it's latching onto the future, but it didn't even try to latch onto the present because you know you're doing it in the moment and I think that's like so gorgeous and like a concept that I love that I've heard people say a few times is like sheltering in the present and just like when you get that thought in your head just be like the only thing that exists is this moment Mm -hmm. and looking around and just being so thrilled that like if there's a larger journey that you have in your mind like a larger life story that you're trying to write and you're anxious about like am I writing it is it going to happen you know like am I going to be that writer am I going to be that dancer the only part of it that's real is the part that's happening right now and we are killing it right now I know <laughs> we're living out I this know. chapter not perfectly <laughs> totally uh as usual I feel like I explained something and then you're like you're doing the bird away and then you just spit it back out in such a concise beautiful way and I'm like Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> She's the queen of the old wrap up. <laughs> this oh was God. a great chat because I feel like the topic for this week was recovering a sense of identity. And I feel like you've given me so much more fodder for thoughts about identity and like what that means and ways we can deconstruct and reconstruct it and tools we can have, whether it's like dressing or like yeah or just letting things get a bit looser so thank you so much for being here next week's topic will be recovering a sense of power and it'll be over on the prime of life link to that in the description do you want to say goodbye to them they're your friends yeah hey guys bye guys No, but yeah, I mean, as always, thank you so much for for being here and for being on this journey. I think this is really fun. And I'm so excited that you're getting to know Ferga more and I'm getting to know Ferga more. She is amazing. So seriously, please go and watch her channel. She has so 
many beautiful videos. Like she just, she does this shit all the time and it's so inspiring. So if you love what we're talking about here and you want to see more of her gold, her video making gold, please go check her out. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right. We'll see you Bye guys. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Art Therapy. The course we are following is based on the book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. If you would like to continue to follow us on this journey, you can find us every week for 12 weeks straight, alternating between Veronica's channel, Veronica Vicora, and my channel, The Prime of Life. You can also click here to gain access to the full playlists of episodes in order. Links to our channels, as well as our various other outlets and to the Artist's Way book in both audio and PDF form can be found in the description. Until next time, sending love.